March 1983. A newly wed Prince Charles and Princess Diana begin a mammoth six-week journey across Australia and New Zealand. It's the first royal tour for a young Princess of Wales, as well as the very young Prince William. The aim of the trip was to strengthen Australia's place in the Commonwealth and boost the royals' popularity. But it also came with many memorable moments, from tears, awkward dancing, and a few bungled speeches. From inside the 7 News Australia vault, we have uncovered every key event and take a deeper look at the unforgettable Aussie visit. Here is what really happened as the then Prince Charles, Princess Diana and Prince William made their way from dusty Alice Springs in the middle of Australia to the bustling streets of Sydney. After days of torrential rain in the Alice, the skies were clear this morning as the Royal Australian Air Force jet made its approach. A flight to Alice Springs from London was a direct one with only one refuelling stop at a place kept secret for security reasons. After a wait of several minutes, the Prince and Princess emerged showing no sign of the long flight and obviously well educated in the right sort of clothes to wear in Central Australia. The line of dignitaries was a short one for their arrival Military officials, the new Federal Minister of State, Mick Young, and his wife, and the Northern Territory Chief Minister, Paul Everingham, with his wife. And then the moment more than a hundred reporters and cameramen flew from all over the world to see the public debut of nine-month-old Prince William, second in line to the throne. The barrage of cameras and recorders was reduced to chaos as the royal nanny, Miss Barbara Barnes, brought Prince William down the stairs. His first public showing was to be in the airport terminal building but media officers decided the scores of camera flashes would be too much for the baby prince. Instead, it was a brief trip to the tarmac and then a pose for the cameras with mum and dad. Prince William was then whisked back aboard the plane and taken straight to Albury and the nearby Wamagama station where he'll spend his entire time in Australia. The prince and princess then made their way through the crowd as hundreds of necks were stretched to get a glimpse over the heads of the media. The royal couple stopped several times to chat with the crowd some of whom had driven hundreds of kilometres for this moment. And then with great difficulty, the crowd was parted as they got into their car and made off for the Gap Hotel, which is to be their home for two nights. Yet another crowd of about 500 waited all morning outside the hotel for one glimpse of the couple. Briefly, very briefly, they did see Prince Charles slip across the balcony from one room to another. But that was all. When the Prince and Princess did leave about an hour and a half later, they did so quietly and unnoticed out a back door. But tomorrow it becomes hectic again. First a royal tour of the St John Ambulance Centre here, and then the Princess will speak to children via the School of the Air. Later the entire royal party will fly to Ayers Rock. The Prince and Princess of Wales could have been forgiven for thinking they were back home this morning with a wind chill factor of three degrees on the tarmac of Canberra's Air Force Base. They were welcomed here by the Governor General and Lady Stephen and Bob and Hazel Hawke. Mr Hawke's father Clem was there, together with a big crowd of well-wishers. There was an inspection of the Guard of Honour, a short chat with each of the local dignitaries, and then a chance to meet the people. <laughs> then to Canberra's Civic Centre, where the locals had taken up all sorts of vantage points to catch a glimpse of the royal couple. There was a street walk. For some, the emotion of meeting Princess Diana was just too much. Others used a different approach to attract her attention. The next stop for the Prince and Princess was the site for the new Parliament House, due for completion in 1988. The dust from the site gave us all a royal sneeze. They were here to unveil a special plaque commemorating the relaying of a stone originally laid here on Capitol Hill in 1920 by the Prince of Wales, later King Edward VIII. And flying above were two flags, on top that of the Aboriginal people and below the Eureka flag. As the couple left the site, this man slipped one of these tiny Eureka flags through the window to Princess Diana. She said it was lovely. It was a sign to the royals that at least some Australians want to see this country eventually declared a republic. This man is one of them. Mr and Mrs Hawke had the Prince and Princess to the lodge today for lunch. Tonight, the royal visitors dine at Government House with the Governor-General, the Prime Minister and a broad cross-section of Australian society, ranging from the judiciary to artists, sportsmen and the military. Lee Hatcher in Canberra for Seven National News.
Today's visit was not on the original schedule for Charles and Diana, but they'd expressed a wish to see the areas where the fires had caused so much destruction and heartbreak. After being shown the extent of all the Victorian fires on a map, they met a number of the emergency service personnel who had spent Ash Wednesday in the Cockatoo area. The local CFA men presented Prince Charles with their last helmet, suitably inscribed Cockatoo, March 1983, a time they'll never forget. Then, further along the line, they continued to chat. And it wasn't all small talk either. His question then was directed, how do they start? Uh, suggesting that perhaps it was human, uh, human cause, and we said yes, it probably was, but uh, whether accidental or otherwise hasn't been determined at this time. And then it was through the rest of the throng up to the top of the hill, to the Cockatoo Kindergarten, the place that for so many people who lived around this area was a haven during the bushfires. The impression to be given to the royal visitors and the entourage was that it was kinder as usual today the littlies at their tables, many armed with posies of flowers and some quite lovely gifts for the children's favourite, little Prince William. But try asking a four-year-old what it was like to meet their Royal Highnesses. That's not such an easy job as I found out. Simon, what did you say to the princess? I said, I said, how come did she, how come did she hurt a baby? And then outside for a simple but moving ceremony, the planting of a tree that's to symbolise the regrowth of the hills. Then, more than half an hour behind schedule, it was goodbye to Cockatoo and to Tullamarine to board their RAAF jet to Adelaide. A short while ago, we received this report on their arrival there. Large crowds of people, many with flags in hand, waited patiently in the main terminal building and along roads leading to the airport. The RAAF jet carrying Prince Charles and Princess Diana eventually touched down about 50 minutes late. Both the State Premier, John Bannon, and his wife, Angela, were on hand to meet the royal couple as they set foot on the tarmac. For many of those who waited quietly in the chilly autumn weather, the night was something of a disappointment. After a brisk walk past the ever-present media contingent and a quick wave to their many admirers, the royal pair were whisked off to Government House where they'll spend the night. Tomorrow, their busy itinerary again begins in earnest. In the morning, Prince Charles and Lady Diana will travel to the Stirling Oval to meet the many victims of the recent fires and floods in South Australia. They'll travel through the fire-ravaged hills and through the Yarrabee Road area where a number of people died when their homes were destroyed on Ash Wednesday. If the royal couple can be credited with easing the drought, then they can be credited with having brought sunshine to Sydney as well. From the moment the Prince and Princess stepped from their aircraft this morning and the clouds lifted, the warmth from both sides was unmistakable. Prince Charles has done all this many times before, but if there were any doubts about the ability of Lady Diana to cope with the crowds, they were soon dispelled. Her innate shyness gave way to a natural self-assuredness, and here at the airport as elsewhere, she displayed the rapport with children for which she's become justly famous. Youth was the keynote of the couple's first official engagement. They switched to an open Rolls Royce and travelled through the Botanic Gardens to the Opera House for undoubtedly the biggest welcome of this tour so far. Hundreds, perhaps thousands of children from all over Sydney bathed the Opera House forecourt in a sea of faces. And as the combined school's concert got underway, their voices reached a crescendo which would hearten any monarchist and perhaps even move the most hardened Republican as well. This was not the place to express even the slightest doubt about Australia's royal ties. The official welcome to New South Wales was made by Premier Neville Wran, who had a special word for the most closely scrutinised royal lady in history. To Her Royal Highness, on her first official visit, I need only say that I am certain that in the years ahead, she will come to share the interest in and love for Australia, its land, its beauty and its people, which we all know has been held by the Prince of Wales from the days of his youth. Whether or not Prince Charles still harbours any desire to become Australia's Governor-General, there's little doubt of his continuing affection for the country and his eagerness for Lady Diana to feel the same. I have been here many times before, but I do genuinely feel that I am among old and valued friends. 
old because it is now 17 years, believe it or not, since I first set foot as a hesitant pom. in this vast and exciting land. After the official speeches, the entertainment in song and dance from infants to high school students. Concert over, the royal couple took to the streets of Sydney. The good weather and office lunchtime aside, the turnout, being watched so closely this time round, was impressive. At Parliament House, the royal couple were welcomed by another large crowd, and after receiving yet another armful of gifts and posies, went inside for a state reception. After lunch, the prince and princess went on to Government House to rest, and this evening they'll be attending a charity ball at the Sheraton Wentworth Hotel. In short, a successful visit, which proves once again just how popular this royal couple really is. Graham Davis, 7 National News. This is what nearly 500 people paid $150 a double to see at close hand. The first ever dance by the Prince and Princess of Wales at a public function anywhere. somewhat awkward debut on the dance floor was the highlight of last night's ball at the Sheraton Wentworth, which raised $12,000 for the Benevolent Society of New South Wales. The royal guests left at the reasonable hour of 11, but while the princess slept in, Prince Charles was up early for his morning after remedy, a swim at Bondi Beach. The conditions weren't brilliant, with a heavy undertow and the water suspiciously murky in true Bondi style. But whatever his posse of bodyguards thought about being dragged out early, Prince Charles himself pronounced his 15-minute dunking very enjoyable. Happily, there was no repetition of the kiss on the royal cheek that put the prince on the world's front pages last time, and he was able to return to Government House with a clear conscience. Later in the morning, the royal couple flew to Newcastle, and a tumultuous welcome by more than 40,000 schoolchildren in the city's sports complex. With the international press loaded into what looked rather like a cattle truck, the couple circled the arena to the kind of reception normally reserved in this age group for pop stars. As she watched the program of entertainment, Lady Diana's normally flawless features plainly sported the dark circles of a late night out. But it was Prince Charles who seemed to forget just how young his audience was with these rather unroyal remarks. We have both been uh, greatly impressed by the display you've put on uh, this morning. No doubt most of you will now need to have a long rest and at least several tubes of beer to recover. And then it was on to Newcastle proper and a civic welcome at the town hall. More crowds, more speeches. Later this afternoon, the royal couple travelled to Maitland for both a civic welcome and a state reception to mark the end of their official visit to New South Wales. And then they returned to Albury to be reunited once again with Prince William at Womargama Station, their Australian base. Graham Davis, 7 National News. It's been said that wherever the royal couple go in Australia, the clouds and rain follow shortly after. And it's that coincidence which is starting to make the prince and princess even more welcome for any drought-hit state and its eager royal watchers. A few drops fell before the RAAF BAC 111 arrived at 5 past 11 this morning, rousing the expectant and excited children who scrambled along with some 50 members of the media to catch a first glimpse of the future British King and Queen. For the princess, it's her first visit to Tasmania, although Prince Charles is now a veteran on his fourth trip, the last time being in April 1981 when he conferred city status on Devonport. Time pressed on and the couple moved to their next engagement. 
That was to be Rokeby High School, Tasmania's latest and most modern comprehensive community school. Although many people here had spent weeks preparing for the visit, it was to be all over in half an hour. The Royals tour of the high school included a visit to the library, where about 80 children were involved in activities of different kinds. Both the prince and princess seemed to take particular interest in the fly-making operation, the prince being a keen fisherman. He seemed to have an instant rapport with these high school students. Not easy with all these interruptions. <laughs> is this, is this, are you, I mean, do you do this once a week? Or, 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 just part of the It is. Princess Diana chose to keep her back to the clustered media area until later outside, where the rest of the school had their chance for a royal meet. To the formalities and Prince Charles again resorted to humour. I hope we haven't interrupted your studies too much. In fact, I thought it might be a rather good idea if we interrupted them even more. Looking at you all, we thought, my wife and I, that you were in bad need of an extra day off. We're going to have the day off tomorrow. Last time I was here was two years ago, uh, in 1981, shortly before uh, we were married. And uh, at that time, everybody was saying, good luck, and I hope everything goes well, and how lucky you are to be engaged to such a lovely lady. And my goodness, I was lucky enough to marry her. And uh, we had many, <laughs> many of us... what ladies do when your back's turned. <laughs> you gave us a wonderful wedding present, whether you know about it or not. <laughs> In fact, it was extremely useful and uh, has ensured, I may say, that our son was born with at least six silver spoons in his mouth. <laughs> Albury was delighted to be playing host to the royal couple at the extra special Easter Sunday service at St Matthew's Anglican Church. From early this morning, thousands from the River City and surrounding areas gathered outside the church waiting for just a glimpse of the prince and princess who've been relaxing at nearby Wamagama. About 300 parishioners crammed into St Matthew's as the couple took Holy Communion and the prince read a passage from the New Testament. Albury had turned on perfect weather for Charles and Diana as they strolled through the city square after the service. Their walkabout lasted 20 minutes and to the delight of the 12,000 eager onlookers, the royal couple chatted freely to the select few. And the princess's ever-growing posy collection was given its daily rejuvenation. The couple later bid Albury farewell and boarded an RAAF jet bound for Sydney where Greg Hoy caught up with them. By contrast, it was cold and wet for the royal couple's return to Sydney this afternoon. They were greeted at Warwick Farm by Prince Charles' great friend and ex-polo instructor, Sinclair Hill and Mrs Hill. A quick snack and Prince Charles was off to select his four horses for the ensuing polo match. Princess Diana, who has never been an avid polo enthusiast, followed to watch the selection. That done, the two teams took the field giving Princess Diana the opportunity to have a royal natter with one of her ex-London flatmates. Playing at number four for the very strong President's team, Prince Charles, who had not played polo for seven months, struck remarkable form. Though we were assured His Royal Highness's team had not been stacked for the match, it didn't take them long to overpower their opposition, substantiating the claim that when it comes to polo at least, everything this prince touches turns to goals. Greg Hoy reporting, Seven National News. The shock royal gaff came at a special children's welcome at Bunbury's Main Oval. 13,000 children from 87 southwest schools and more than 1,000 parents had gathered in special lines for the royal visit. They'd been forced to wait patiently in threatening weather until the royal couple finally arrived nearly half an hour late. The delay had built up the level of excitement and the children were attentive to the prince's every word. Prince Charles revealed several homely tales he said he'd gathered from the writings of an Australian woman settler in 1897. The 26,000 young ears heard the royal formula for good behaviour, including these words. 
ill temper can disorder the mind, and vulgarity excludes one from good society. Then the prince dropped his right royal clangor as a wind gust blew his speech notes away. <laughs> The prince's aside, got my bloody bit of paper, brought wide laughter from the thousands of children and parents. It was then the prince continued reading the speech, describing swearing as contemptible and foolish. It wasn't the only incident to shake the usually stiff royal upper lip. Earlier, someone threw an apple at the royal couple as they were driving to the Oval from the airport. But it was later found the apple was a good-natured gesture, aimed at having the royal couple try the local produce. There was also some words from the prince on the missing member of the royal family. Sadly, we couldn't bring our son here. He isn't quite old enough, I'm afraid, for this kind of, of thing. And I haven't actually trained him to make speeches yet. Well, the prince's swearing got him into hot water in Bunbury, but just hours earlier, he plunged again into the chilly waves of North Cot. This morning's swim was quite different to yesterday's men-only affair. Today, there was an attractive blonde. Prince Charles took the plunge at North Cottesloe Beach again this morning and ended up in the swim with a beautiful gate crasher. Soon after the prince started swimming, an attractive acquaintance from his 1979 visit dived into the water and made her way directly out to the paddling prince. The royal bodyguards were alarmed and at first tried to stop 27-year-old Leslie Meadmore from reaching him. But suddenly, the prince recognised her and called out her name. She swam over and the pair spent 20 minutes in the water together. Leslie says they talked about young Prince William just starting to crawl and what happens when babies start to walk. Leslie, who has two children herself, was recognised by the prince during his swim yesterday. It was in 1979 at a North Cottesloe Surf Club barbecue that the couple first met. At that time, they spent two hours chatting together. The day before the showstopper swim, Leslie described the prince as a real gentleman and a superb man. And all the best fairy tales have a happy ending, and so it was at Perth Airport as the royal couple bade farewell after arriving half an hour late back from Bunbury. Trisha Duffield reports. Despite the delay, the royal couple took their time as they wandered casually across the tarmac to meet the waiting crowd. The princess, wearing a soft grey and white suit, matching hat and contrasting red shoes and handbag, accepted the dozens of posies, toys, even a plastic cup and saucer set for baby Prince William as she chatted easily with her fans. The informality of the West Australian farewell was characteristic of the tour. It took almost half an hour for the royal couple to walk the short distance to their aircraft. Then it was time for formal farewells to Premier Brian Burke and his wife and Governor and Lady Trowbridge before the plane taxied to the runway and then lifted off into the clouds for the journey back to Albury and a reunion with their baby son. First stop was a visit to the Yandina Ginger Factory, just north of Nambour, with the prince and princess always playing their roles to a tee. If they thought the factory tour a little dull, as some critical parts of the southern press described it, the royal couple didn't show it. They seemed perfectly enthralled with the workings of the plant, taking time to chat with somewhat overwhelmed workers. But soon they were back on the road, this time south to the CSR Macadamia Nut Factory, passing yet hundreds more well-wishers along the 20-kilometre route. Again, a brief factory tour, while a sea of fans waited expectantly outside the popular tourist spot. But the piece de resistance of the day had to be a royal jaunt on a nutmobile. In something slightly less than a royal carriage, the couple wound their way through crowds and banana trees to the neighbouring Sunshine Plantation, home of the Big Pineapple. Certainly the management here had never hosted such a day, and despite some 10,000 onlookers, they tried to make the royal tourists feel at home with a tropical lunch and yet another sightseeing ride, this time on a sugar train. Prince Charles said he hoped to bring Prince William back here one day, and said his only regret was that he wouldn't have time for a swim during their runaround of the famous Sunshine Coast beaches. The Princess of Wales wore a white silk dress with large red polka dots and teamed it with a neat red jacket to ward off the Melbourne chill. It's another new outfit we haven't seen on this tour, although Diana has worn the hat before. After an official greeting by the Governor, Sir Brian Murray, and Premier John Kane, the couple spent 10 minutes walking to their car past the cheering schoolchildren. From the airport, the royal entourage drove to Altona's Paisley Estate. 
The 400 residents showed their enthusiasm with red, blue and white balloons flying from any available point. Squeals of delight greeted Charles and Diana and there was the usual profusion of posies for this favourite princess. From early morning the crowds made their way into the city. Small children with flags and posies lined the barriers while shoppers and office workers filled the roadways and footpaths. The royal couple left their limousine at the town hall for the walk to the mail open, up Swanson Street and into Burke Street. The kids broke the barriers first, rushing up with their flowers, and then it was the myriad of outstretched hands and the waves, the flags and the attendant police. The prince and princess then got down to official business, the opening of the Burke Street Mall. And as Anthony Trollope said when he visited here in 1872, magnificent though Melbourne might be, there's no street in it that's finished. But at least this one is. And he had a word of warning for would-be users of the mall. And we, both of us, have great pleasure, as I say, in declaring it open and trusting that nobody gets run down by the trams which still operate here. Victorians braved the bitterly cold wind at the Spencer Street station this morning to catch a glimpse of their favourite royals. And a glimpse is all they got. Running behind schedule, the royal couple met the official welcoming party and boarded straight on to the train. The gifts of flowers were left to wilt in the outstretched hands and this little girl's face reflected the disappointment felt by many. From the special observation platform, the royal couple were able to wave to the thousands of fans as they passed through the towns to Ballarat, where they received a tumultuous welcome. The people who crowded the historic station and the Bridge Mall were not disappointed. Both the Prince and the Princess of Wales made a special point of speaking to as many people as possible, especially the children. Suitable clothes seemed to be a major problem for the Princess on the Australian tour and today appeared no exception. The wind played havoc with her flimsy cotton skirt and the prince, as he addressed the crowd, was obviously feeling the cold in his lightweight suit. We've been now all the way around Australia to every single state and this certainly has been the coldest day of the entire expedition. It was then off to Sovereign Hill, a replica of Ballarat in the gold rush days. Shopkeepers and children were in period costume to capture the atmosphere of the 1850s. A Cop & Co coach took Prince Charles and his wife into the diggings before stopping for lunch in the United States Hotel. Royal fever continued in Bendigo where they again strolled through the streets and were entertained by the Chinese Sun Lung Dragon. From Bendigo, the royal couple flew back to Albury for a well-earned rest. Prince William stole the show at today's airport farewell. Arriving at Tullamarine with his nanny, Barbara Barnes, 45 minutes before his parents, should have given him plenty of time to settle down in a specially built wall-mounted cot for the flight across the Tasman. But Prince William preferred to bounce around his aircraft nursery, delighting photographers with his waves out of the small aircraft window. Prince Charles and Princess Diana were on royal time again, late, and had no time for a personal farewell to the crowds at Tullamarine a wave goodbye from the doorway of the New Zealand Air Force jet and the Australian tour was over.